we, when we were here in 2017, we would not have had a title like this. In 2017, it was our first official year with Domain of One's Own, and we were like diving in, moving really fast, and there was no slowness to anything. It was like all in, all the time. Where can we go? How far can we get? Now, in 2019, um, we have had we have the, um, the experience and uh, the hard-earned wisdom to know that Domains is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And that's why we are invoking um, Emily Dickinson here, which I'll explain in a moment. These are our Twitter handles, if you'd like to find us there. And I mentioned Emily Dickinson, um, bringing her into the space because so much of the domain space for obvious and really important re reasons is shaped by the great Virginia Woolf and the quote about a room of one's own which Martha Burtis uh, spoke of in her keynote in 2017 here which has animated a lot of the writing of Audrey Waters and others. Um, but here we're interested in um, bringing Emily Dickinson's voice into this conversation about, um, about thinking not only about space, a space of one's own, but also the space of imagination and the role that imagination plays in growing over time a domain of one's own initiative. So I need to say something about the word fuse. Um, when I first put this together and checked it out with Tim, I asked him what this image looked like, and he said it's a bomb, it's dynamite, and it didn't go super well with the sort of ethos of caring and creating and making that I try to frame around domains. I mean, certainly we break things too, but, but the fuse was troubling me, and I needed to make sense of that before we could begin to wrap this project around it. And so I want you to know that um, a little bit of etymological research indicates that while fuse, yes, is uh, a cord uh, that when lit conveys the fire to some explosive device like the image you saw, um, a device igniting charge, I mean, we could think about a domain in that kind of way. But I got really excited to discover that um, in, its, in its verb tense, um, fuse is, of course, to melt together, to blend to mix indistinguishably. Now that itself is not, um, you didn't, I didn't need to do research on Wiktionary to know what verb means as a, to know what fuse means as a verb, but the really exciting thing here is that it, it draws from the 15th century old English term, snitan, I don't know if that's how to say it, which means to knit. And so for those of you who know the, the very minimal blogging that I do, my, my domain is called Warp, where Warp meets Weft. And um, part of my domain's journey is continuing to think about the way that um, building digital space is entirely like knitting. So for the knitters in the room, this is my ode to you. And since one of my co-presenters is also a knitter, now we've come first full circle and you know that um, we can use the term fuse here in a very non-destructive way. This is the way in which we think about Domain of One's Own as a slow fuse, a project that builds over time as an intentional knitting together of teachers and learners, practitioners, experiences, knowledge, and importantly, new possibilities. There's a lot in our talk today, or at least in this brief opening framing, that uh, wants to also call into the space some of what the keynote presenter shared this morning around imagination, around um, the ability to picture other worlds and the shrinking space to be able to do that within our current moment of surveillance capitalism. So here's Maxine Green, the philosopher queen of Teachers College, um, writing on the art of teaching writing that to imagine is to transform the ordinary into images of what might be. This is part of the process of teaching with domains at Muhlenberg. Here's Maxine, who wrote that without the capacity to imagine, the ability to enter alternative realities, to bring the as if into being, 
to look at things at least for a time as if they could be otherwise, we would be sentenced to perpetual literalism, to the domain of facts. So it's not surprising then that two of the sites where domains has really grown deep, deep, deep roots is in the space of history and sustainability studies. And so the two faculty who you're going to hear from throughout this presentation today are engaging students in work with domains around historical imagination and engaging students with domains around around imagining sustainable solutions for current and future generations. And so these are the things that, that we want to think about now that we're in, we've, we're finishing our third full year of domains, um, which is to really wonder about the ways that we together create new kinds of possibilities for students to imagine themselves as learners, to imagine what's possible in the space of their learning for faculty to imagine, to reimagine the way they teach, the way they mentor, the way they do their own research. And I think that, um, that there's no better place, there's no better inspiration for that than at the, in that conversation between Virginia Woolf and Emily Dickinson and thinking about just this, you know, domains as a site for imagining other worlds are possible. And so to get us started on sharing how that's going at Muhlenberg, I'm going to invite uh, Tinika to talk about her historical work. Um, okay, thank you. And she glasses, so. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who uh, want to follow along, um, I posted my notes on GitLab. So um, I, I once had a student who had auditory processing issues, and she told me that having comments in slides or having access to text really helped, and I thought, I can do that here too. Also, people who are not in the room, they can follow along that way. Um, I may, of course, deviate somewhat from my script. Um, I like improvising. So uh, let me put a timer, because otherwise I would use some sort of device to keep me on track. So I leave Rich some time as well to talk about this. Uh, I've got some devices here. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've got uh, some devices, <laughs> yes. Uh, so this is just an overview. What I really want to focus on today in, in my presentation is the joys of teaching. I know there's plenty of other things we can focus on when we talk about teaching, but I want to make this a hopeful, joyful moment. Um, and then um, especially I want to um, talk to you about how to maximize level two, which I think is the holy grail of teaching from my point of view. And then I use two case studies um, where I try and explain how I think I achieved some of that, if not all the time, where I'm, I'm working on getting more to that level too. And I conclude with um, a few of the things I learned uh, from this. So my teaching philosophy is really pretty straightforward. Um, I started doing a PhD because I wanted to be a student forever. I wanted to keep <laughs> learning, to keep discovering, um, always be exploring, always sharing things as well. And after teaching full-time for a decade, um, I figured out a few things, including the joyful discovery that being a teacher is indeed, and having, had a P having achieved a PhD, is, it's a good opportunity to remain a student. You never stop learning, especially if you're at a small liberal arts college where you're the only faculty member who knows anything much about East Asian history, and you have to teach Japan, Korea, China, oh heck, why not? I'm pretty sure I could get a course on Vietnam if I wanted to. Um, number two discovery was that teaching, if done well, is a joy. Now, what are those two levels? The first most basic level is the one that probably a lot of us um, who are in a classroom share. It's where you want to inspire joy in the students. Um, and that sort of, that moment where they, they start to sort of think along with you with a text, with an image, with um, you know, historical question that where they get excited about the same thing that you get excited about. Um, and it ends up hopefully then that they come to the, the classroom not because you have a draconian policy of attendance, but because they want to learn with you. Um, and I sort of frame that sometimes as the right to curiosity. Students should have a right to curiosity, to just come to your classroom and, and um, discover things. Um, the main aim with, with being in level one is to take students away from that moment where you are a history teacher that's just shoveling facts into their heads, that never sticks. Get them to the point where they start to ask those basic questions. 
um, even if it's questions that they may not have an answer for at the time, and that we may never have an answer for, because no matter how many tools I give them to teach, um, they, they just, you know, you, you cannot always answer the questions like, uh, what if, what if the Nazis won the war? What if Tiananmen had not been suppressed 30 years ago? Um, counterfactual history, I have my issues with it. But also, they can start to ask questions like, can we do so or so thing? Um, how did or how does, and that sort of started to activate their historical imagination a bit. Um, and then hopefully they can push that further, so the paper is very sticky here. Yeah. <laughs> um, they can push that further towards research or analysis questions where they start to think like, wait a minute, if this is the case, then what about X? Or where they go, what other options were there? Why did people choose this particular option and not something else? So that's what I would call activating historical imagination. That's the moment where I go, yay, I'm <laughs> teaching. So that's level one. If all goes well, we're at level one, I want to get it to level two, where the students make me see things anew, where they start to make me see things that I have looked at a hundred times, the text gets a new insight. They make connections I have not seen, or they allow me to make connections based on an insight they give me, where essentially, we all are learning to know things in a different way. So that's active learning at its best. I don't need to explain that here, I think. It becomes very rewarding for the students when they see me go like, ooh, I never thought of that before. This is great. Um, but also, um, you know, for me as a teacher, this is why I went into this business. I said I wanted to do a PhD because I did not want to stop learning. What if your st students become your teachers, right? So. Obviously, we want to maximize, well, I want to maximize level two. There's a few things I've been experimenting with and trying out um, to try and get um, level two to be, you know, as much there as possible. Um, power dynamics in the classroom are a real thing. No matter how friendly I try to be, obviously, I'm still the person at the end of the semester who gives them a grade. And I want to sort of postpone that grading thing as much as possible. I would love to go gradeless, for instance. A lot of the questions students ask me indicate to me that they expect me to hold a certain authority, such as, will this be on the exam? Uh, we don't have exams, not in my courses. <laughs> um, what's the right answer? That depends on the question you ask, on the material you use. That, you know, in the case of a historical question, that may depend on the material we have available. Um, a lot of the questions are about how to succeed in getting, you know, a certain grade. I try to create, uh, to counter that, um, I try to create spaces where students can take control over the contents of the class. Um, and, and that can be from very small, like choosing their own mini research paper topics. I'm talking about one to two paragraph encyclopedia entries where they explicate something to a fellow student. Um, to sometimes the larger, I'm going to give you an example where I have pretty much half a semester where the students can pick and choose from modules I offer. Um, the second thing that I feel you need to do, it's connected, um, if you sort of going to relinquish power in the classroom, you also have to sort of level the playing field. Now, for those of you who like cricket, um, you may have heard of the Lord's Slope, which is in London, Lord's Cricket Ground has an eight feet drop from north to south. Um, it privileges certain bowlers, it's akin to a pitcher in baseball. Um, so if you, it, you know, depending on whether you're bowling uphill or down the hill, if you have a certain skill, you get an advantage. For me, the unlevel playing field in my field, in my discipline as history, is the essay. Um, I feel that students are required to demonstrate their knowledge by writing me an essay, or a lot of my colleagues. Um, that's not a level playing field. It's the discipline's favorite way of demonstrating or you know, crafting an argument and presenting it. It requires students to adhere to a very specific format. Um, and it takes a lot of training to become good at writing an essay. I mean, I struggle with writing still. There's a reason we have writing intensive courses at our institutions. We acknowledge it's a difficult process. Then why would I think that having the students meet me at where I want to be with, with writing essays, that that is the best way for them to demonstrate that they learn something? In addition, I feel that there are ways that, or there are certain types of learning that can be better demonstrated with different assignments. 
I'm thinking about an analysis of a primary source. It doesn't have to be written. I have to very often do oral presentations. Um, knowing where to go and to find resources. They don't have to write an essay about it. They just got to tell me you know, how they go and find stuff out in the library, for instance. Um, what about geography? A map is so much better. If you have an annotated map, that's going to be so much more powerful in telling me what you learned than writing me an essay with a lot of words about it. So, in general, what I want to do when I say leveling the playing field is I want to move away from using the essay as a, a one-way conversation between the student and the professor, where the professor gets the essay, grades it, gives it back to the student, if the student comes in to pick it up. Very often it will disappear at the end of the semester into a drawer, and then a few years down the line into the shredder. You know, there, there's got to be a better way to have a conversation about what students are learning. Um, the other thing is that how many students will write a college-like essay, college essay thing after they graduate? If we want them to communicate what they have learned in a clear and, and concise manner, an essay may help them to do some of those things, but it's not the only way we can teach them um, to communicate. So I found that the, you know, I wanted to try and find a way to meet the students somewhere in the middle. If I don't want them all to write essays because I feel that they have to come all the way my way, I also don't want to go all the way their way because they're, most of them, I guess, are consuming a lot of their content through prefabricated social media platforms where they don't have a lot of choice about what the environment looks like, but that's where they are consuming their information. So for me, domains is somewhere a nice way to meet in the middle and see if we can do things um, somewhat differently. Um, what, I, what I hope to achieve by using domains is that learning and knowledge is sort of shared with the class um, and if they desire so with the wider world. Um, I can also model the process of learning itself, which is I don't know all the answers to all the tech stuff, which is why I have uh, Tim Clark um, you know, <laughs> regularly knocking on his door, um, asking him, but it, it shows to the students, I don't know the answer, or I made a mistake, let me fix it, let me find help. Um, you know, it shows how learning is a collaborative process, and it should be for them as well, where they do not feel like they should know all the answers. They should know how to ask for help, or where to go and find um, some of the answers and also that they can fix mistakes. Um, a third useful thing about using domains is that it allows me at least to be more flexible um, and include um, different materials, especially for the modern China course. I can add in a lot of news items very quickly. So let me give you two case studies um, where I did some of those things, like leveling the playing field and relinquishing control. Um, China's Magical Creatures is a course uh, website that I've built on the main, so this is what the students use as their portal. Um, this is the syllabus page, it's just a screenshot. I gave all the students also a website, or their own domains um, website, where they were um, writing certain uh, small assignments in the first half of the semester. First half of the semester, I decided what the material was we were going to cover. But I have more material than I can possibly fit into this course. So what I did was um, I relinquished control over the contents. And somewhere in, I think it was week six or week seven, we sat down as a group. And we, you know, they had all the descriptions of the modules that were possible. They had all of the texts that we would read in connection with that. And they just said yes or no to certain mod modules. So they were like, yeah, we'll do the mountain goblins. <laughs> I don't fancy doing this stuff about the dream of the red chamber. So I'm like, OK, fine. Um, so we, we put it together that way. And so the second half of the semester, this was um, pretty much, except for week nine, all of the other ones. You see, we have editorial meetings. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so this was decided by the students. I picked the sequence that would work best they had a big buy-in in what we were actually looking at. Um, in the, um, the other thing I made them do was instead of giving them essays to write was give them um, writing with a clear direction. And um, this is where the, the websites came in. So let me just briefly go, oh, we're in a time. Ah, okay. So let me give you a few examples of what the students did. They did small writing assignments. And what they did with those was I, I gave them the small assignments that would prepare them 
to write for a very different audience because what we decided, or what I decided at the beginning of the semester, and they could opt out if they chose, was we were going to work towards a textbook, an open education resource textbook for this course. So um, I've had uh, fellow people, uh, fellow, fellow um, people in, in Sinology and Chinese studies tell me, this is such a cool course. I want, um, I want the syllabus, or why don't you write a textbook uh, in my copious spare time? <coughs> I thought students are actually much better positioned to do this kind of thing than I am because they know what they don't know. They know what they need to understand about this topic. Why not let them craft um, the contents of, of these chapters with me guiding them through it? So to do that, to get them to the point where they felt comfortable writing a 1200 word chapter um, that would be shared with the wider world. I had them do small exercises, including talking about our library session. There were fun things like survival guide for the intrepid time traveler. <laughs> um, and what this student did, she, she actually said, I'm quite proud of my blog. Um, so she included images. So the students took complete control of what their website looked like. Um, someone else used their website um, to essentially participate outside of the classroom. So this was uh, a link to a um, news article that talked about in connection with a text or an event that we talked about in class, where you find archaeology and myth maybe meeting each other. So for me, this counts as participation. Here's a student browsing the web, bumping into this thing, and putting it out there. Um, so learning is happening because the students are getting interested. And then the students would also be um, you know, they could also use their website to do fun things like, I think, images, <laughs> videos, memes. There's going to be some memes in the textbook. Um, so the students are actually sort of exploring all these different things. Um, so in terms of writing with a clear direction, they were given a chance here to experiment, get used to, get feedback, and then eventually um, the, the textbook I'm working on, you know, putting everything together on the back end, but the textbook has got very different voices. Some are very academic serious, others are more fun and colloquial. And I'm, I'm thinking that's the way the textbook should be if it's written by students. So that was one case. Let me give you the other one. Uh, different computer. Mm -hmm. um, OK. In the Modern China course, again, I set this up with my own little website, so you have the syllabus. Um, what I did was I created digital assignments, because one of the problems that I discovered with this course is um, a regular flavor survey course from 1600 to the present, History of China. We use Jonathan Spencer's um, Search for Modern China and the associated documentary collection. It's fast-paced. We go at one chapter per session, 28 chapters through the, through the semester. Um, two reasons why I wanted students to use digital assignments is the first was I don't like grading and I've always been told if you don't like grading, change the assignment. It works. Um, the other one was that I discovered that students had in their essays when I first taught the course, they showed no consistency or no understanding of what was happening when and where. And there were some strange things happening with the space-time continuum in China. <laughs> Um, in those essays. <laughs> so um, I thought I got to solve this problem and what I did was um, give students or hope, you know, find assignments that would give students a better way of um, understanding what was happening when and where. So it was very easy because we had, these, we had this text, we had um, 28 chapters, I had 25 students and I had the students do assignments, uh, digital assignments, or the digital commons as I called it at the time even. Um, oh, again, going the wrong way. Yes. No. yes, I'm going the right way. What I did with them was two things. One was a collective map where um, each student had one chapter where they were responsible for finding four to five pound points on the map. And as you see, it even goes all the way to England because opium crisis, right? Yeah. Um, with the opium war. And so the students did fun things like adding images to, um, so you, you see they're, they're adding images, they add text, um, a small, exp a brief explanation. Each student had um, four to five points, and they all used specific little 
colored pins to go with that chapter, so it became easier for the other st students when they were reviewing, oh, that's chapter 25, that's chapter 3. And the other thing I did was there were five parts to the textbook, so each part had a different layer. So that way we could disaggregate a little bit what was happening in 1600 from what was happening in 1989. Um, the, other thing they did, so there were three assignments per chapter. Three students would work together on one chapter, each with one distinctive assignment. One did the map, one did the timeline, one did the chapter summary in text. The timeline they, they liked really a lot in terms of doing it, but also in terms of um, playing with it and adding things like, for instance here, the Summer Olympics, so they can add graphics to it. Um, sometimes they would add um, little links so you could link out or videos. So to them this now became something that was very much alive. Um, and the result of the, then they also did a blog post that was a summary of the chapter and then the main points in the, um, that, that were raised in class. The result was actually pretty positive. Um, I was not pulling my hair out when I was reading essays. The space-time continuum was much more in track with what I and my colleagues knew about Chinese history. So I would say it was a success. Um, um, the students told me that they thought the timeline was very useful, the chapter summaries were as well. The maps, they were a bit ambivalent, so I'm not sure how I'm going to take that forward. So what have I learned from all of these things? Well couple of things. First of all, students are very creative if you give them the space. Um, but you've got to give them the space. The second thing is, if they enjoy an assignment or if they become curious about the, the, the stuff you teach, they spend more time on it, they deliver a higher quality product. It makes for a happy teacher. Um, you also need good tech support, I found out. So we're very lucky to have the Hive and our digital learning assistants. Um, experimentation and failure, those go, go kind of hand in hand, because if you create room for experimentation, you can expect failure. And one of the things that I have built in now into all my classes is my assignments, or the, the revision for assignments for portfolio work, stays open until the end of the semester. Um, or I give them a chance to rework. For instance, all the timeline entries, uh, all the map points, they were they were getting peer reviews, and then the student, so from everyone else on that same chapter team, and then they got a chance to rework, and only then were they graded. So they could fail, they could try something completely off the wall, fail, and then retake and, and do something more traditional. So the result was that the grading was a lot more fun, because the first time around when they were experimenting, I wasn't grading them, so I wasn't getting frustrated, they were doing what I wanted. Um, and then the second time round, they had got the idea of where we needed to go with the project or the idea, and they would end up with a better final result that everyone could be happy about. So I, I ended up having a higher GPA, um, I think, on average, and I think, Rich, you have a similar experience. Um, I still don't particularly enjoy grading essays, but as I've said, it was a lot less painful than it has been in past years, so I was happy. I'm not quite sure I'm going to take all of this next, so I'd really love to hear from all of you um, what ideas you have, what experiences you have, um, how to sort of grant students that right to curiosity. And I think Rich, you have a few things um, that are very similar in terms of having students explore things. So, over to you. Thank you. I'm going to take this. Well, I mean, one of the great things about this whole domains project is you get to be inspired by your colleagues like this. This is what they do, and they, they raise the bar. I have to admit that when you first came to Muhlenberg and when Laura was talking about this domain thing, I was a little bit skeptical, mainly because of my own inability to make a domain, but um, I've kind of uh, figured that out along the way, and now I'm all in because I've seen the results with the students. So I want to tell you a little bit about how that, that, that works. So, we have a program called Sustainability Studies. It's the next generation of environmental studies, which puts it in the context of what the UN calls sustainability. Um, there's a lot of definitions out there. In fact, I spend the first two weeks of my class defining it, uh, and some semesters it's different than the other. But generally, we think of sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We think of sustainability, sustainable development as increasing the basic standard of living of the world's expanding population without unnecessarily depleting our resources or impacting the planet. 
it links human justice with conservation. It's not just conserving nature. It's integrating those two things. Sometimes it's uh, easier to think what something isn't rather than what it is. Michael Pollan called uh, an unsustainable system as a practice or process that can't go on indefinitely because it's destroying the very conditions on which it depends. If you like images like me, this might help you better. So, um, so the one thing is that, that sustainability, the field of sustainability is truly interdisciplinary, it's integrative, and it's about making interconnections. And these three, among these three spheres, society and social justice, um, environment, uh, and then uh, it's got to be economically sustainable for it to move forward. In other words, you can't protect a piece of land on which people are um, making their living hunting on it without allowing for them to make a living and without allowing for uh, decision making and processes to be socially just. And when we're, we hit that sweet spot here, uh, we achieve sustainability. Some of the learning objectives that are in sustainability uh, education, and, we, and there's all sorts of uh, competencies that are coming out that are being debated, but uh, we have to identify the problems uh, if we're going to solve them and then focus on solving those problems. We want to give um, access and ability to assess the latest information. We want uh, uh, their learning experience to be active and hands-on. Uh, communication is really important about uh, part about sustainability, how to talk across difference. I mean, we see this great divide in our own country, um, but there's lots of division out there and it's finding common value system. Um, we employ systems thinking. We look both locally and globally and we see very different things at those scales. Um, we want our students to interact with peers and experts, not just at Muhlenberg College, but globally. Um, and that involves external collaboration. We want them to learn how to use technology to help achieve the mission of sustainability. We want them to learn about stakeholders, who they are, and how to engage them. Um, we recognize that, we heard a little bit about entrepreneurship, the negative sides and positive sides this morning, but uh, it's a key component to sustainability um, because it's a way, if uh, entrepreneurship is done in a socially just way and an environmental way, it's a way to, to sustain those things um, with income. And we want students to learn with uh, how to work with organizations, institutions, and in social movements. So ideally, uh, this is what uh, our teaching would look like in sustainability, where our students are out in the world, they're doing hands-on experience, they're learning from experts, they're becoming the experts themselves. This is just my students who, a handful of students that I get to take to Costa Rica every year. It's a rough job, but uh, <laughs> some of do it. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, in a lot of schools, uh, this is what sustainability uh, education looks like, sitting in a classroom um, facing forward, which is, uh, domains has allowed, us, allowed me to sort of break that pattern. So domains has allowed us to move beyond the classroom to meet those objectives in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I want to give some examples of this. Um, so one thing I do, much like we heard uh, with, the, with the Asian studies is that um, I like to link my assignments, I like to keep them alive, I allow them to revise them throughout the semester. And the assignments vary from year to year, but they include, they pick a problem, a problem they're interested in it, and they have to articulate it. And you'd be surprised how hard they, they have first finding a problem and then being able to talk about it. But as they work on the other assignments, they come to better recognize their problem and they can go back, because it's on the web, it's on the domain, they can go back and revise that problem. It's not, it's not a one and done thing. And some of the things, the next assignment is often, often what can I as an individual do to solve that problem? Um, what are some tools that are out there, like uh, uh, they have uh, calculators, like what are footprint calculators? What are organizations, whether they're governments, NGOs, what are they doing? I teach them to approach the, their problem using systems analysis. And this is incredible. When they do the, I, I kind of, I didn't know that they would like this. There's not a lot of systems thinking being taught at our school. But when they did this, they all went back and resolved the, re, uh, redid their problem because they thought about it in a bigger way. Um, I have them come up with a business solution and I also want them to think um, globally and ultimately, they have to come up with some campaign for change. All of this is done on the web. 
Um, also, as they're working on their domains, they interact with each other. Uh, here you can see using hypothesis with my comments, but they're also required to comment on each other's pages, giving feedback, even if it's something just great photos. At least they're looking at each other's pages. They're looking. But what happens in this dialogue is usually, like, how'd you do that? And how'd you figure that out? And those kinds of questions. Um, and so um, then um, I'll give you an example of this, but I use, like, like we just saw, um, mapping. One of the problems with sustainability education is the students become very narrowly focused on their own community. So like they want to fight for uh, the elimination of plastic on their own campus, or they want composting in the dining hall. And, and I sort of bought into that until I got into this domains thing and said, you know, this is a much bigger world out there besides our small liberal arts college. And like, let's move beyond that and ask where are, they, where are these problems occurring and how are they solving them? So I, I just want to walk you through um, two of my student domains, and all of them are online, and I can show you how to get this. So let's start. I think they're already up. Do I hit escape yeah. to get there? Yeah. And then you I can go, go to, let's go to food deserts first. So, so this is actually a student that's a double major in public health and sustainability. So she picked a subject that dealt with both quite well. and. Um, she was interested in food deserts, which are locations, um, some of which are in, in our fair city of Allentown, where um, people do not have access to healthy, nutritious, unprocessed foods. Um, so, you know, the first assignment is to identify the problem. And so, I'm kind of, I'm not going to ask you to read this, but she goes <laughs> on and defines this problem within the context of the definition of sustainability that, that we've come up with. You can see they're also required to maintain a Twitter feed uh, relevant to their subject, and that's where they get a lot of their external information. And we also work on uh, discussing what is an appropriate Twitter source versus a, a less appropriate Twitter source. Um, in individual action, it's what it's what you can do, you know. And so you can see, um, you know, she did. Just, aesthetically but also the writing through revision has come really come along. I wanted to show you the systems thinking exercise because they draw this systems map where we have four quadrants which is the problems here in the middle, food deserts, these are the causes, these are some solutions, these are, um, let's see, these are who's affected and these are some limitations or barriers and you can see it's not a simple linear Thing. There's a lot of complicated things going on. When they see this, they end up going back and have and revise their former essays or entries because they have some realization. That's the aha moment that that we kind of thrive on as teachers. They have to pick uh, an institution or policy. So, um, you know, uh, and uh, then uh, they also have to come up with an innovative approach that generates income to keep it going. Um, and then, uh, this is what I wanted to show you in terms of the map, um, to get them thinking beyond their narrow world. Um, they use this, the story map JS, again with imagery, and they have to pick at least five locations from different parts of the world where the problem's really being addressed effectively. Um, so you can click through this, uh, Brazil, which we just talked about, and um, the UK, and so various parts of the world. So now they're thinking globally about sustainability. Um, so I kind of take them from the individual action to the larger system to the global. Um, we'll take a quick look at, um, the last assignment is to uh, I might have to go back on. Well, we'll look at the, We'll look at this on the next one. This is another one uh, where this student recognized that access to energy is not is something we take take for granted. So, indoor air pollution, for example, because people are cooking inside, kills 3.4 million people a year, more than HIV and malaria combined. Something we we never hear about in the public health. We hear about Ebola that kills a few people, but this is 3.4 million people a year because they don't have access to energy. And so Kiara worked on this, and meant, you know the same assignments. I'm not going to walk you through, but she, you know, in terms of the last assignment, 
They, they have to sort of make a recommendation for action. They have to clearly state their problem. They have to have um, an approach. Uh, and it could be anything from a letter writing campaign to an educational campaign to creating some organization. For example, I have one student who rec who's going to dental school next year, and she recognized that dentistry produces more plastic, more waste than, than so many other fields that she's um, starting a green, well, it's not nice to think about green teeth, but uh, <laughs> a green dentistry or, or sustainable dentistry club for the graduate students to think about ways to make it more sustainable. So kind of some great things a result from this um, that I, if I, like you said, if I control the curriculum, I would never have arrived at. I would have never even thought of the dentistry thing. Um, so um, let's see, so this goes back to present. So um, this, I've done some assessment uh, in, a, in a very um, informal way by handing out paper and asking them to answer these questions. And the students feel, um, by using these domains, uh, greater connectedness among each other because they're helping each other out, they're, uh, uh, they're reviewing each other's work. But more importantly, they see this connection among assignments, and I think this is what you were saying. You often get the, the paper, and you throw it away, or put it in a drawer and get the next paper. But here, because it's alive on the web, they go back and like, wait, this, if I put this assignment up, the first assignment no longer makes sense. I have to go back and fix it. Um, and I think that, that is really one of the great values of all this. They see connections among the disciplines as they work on these things and they're able to access the global sustainability community. So that's what I mean by living assignments. They, these assignments stay alive. They have a more global experience. They have greater ownership. This is one thing like, I think when Laura would say, well, the students have greater ownership over their work. I didn't really fully understand until I started discussing it with my students. And because it's public, um, they do. They, and they don't throw it away. They feel like it's their work. And I think that's important. Um, and then they also, something that's often, that I really haven't heard talked about, they like the fact that they now have a new skill, like mm -hmm. when they enter the job market, which is they can make a web page, and if they're going to be working for an NGO or for the government, um, this, is, this is highly valuable. So, um, so uh, you can go to my uh, web page where I have, um, well, not quite as nice as Tim's uh, <laughs> approach, I kind of stole the idea from him, but um, the, you can find my students' uh, domains there if you want to explore them, um, and I keep I keep them up and I keep them fresh. But like I truly am converted, um, and but not only that, I think that conversion now has my mind open to any other possibilities uh, with regard to to my thinking. So thank you all to the domains community for sort of kicking me in the butt. I like to think of myself as mid-career. Some people might <laughs> think it's a little later. Um, but with that, I think maybe we'll open it up to the panel and, and for questions. Yeah, we'd love to take your questions. And, and as we do that, I'll just point out that clearly, clearly having two faculty at different points in the career, Tinnick has been at Muhlenberg two years, Rich is mid-career. That's how long I work. But, but their, their willingness, their enthusiasm, their, uh, and their willingness to just share publicly what they're doing and, and to be vulnerable, I think, uh, among their faculty peers and their students has, has been, that's the thing that, that lights the slow fuse of possibility is just that energy from the faculty. I, w I would like to say that a lot of the work is actually from the students. Um, the, the map points wouldn't be there without the students. The domains for your course wouldn't be there without the students. So we, we're just, I see myself more as a facilitator in that sense. Um, yeah. And, the so and, the, and we have this digital learning assistant program and so many times I'm stuck and yep. they, I say, time to go. In fact, I, once a semester I bring the whole class down to where they're located so they, they go <laughs> and they go. Questions. Yeah. Um, so I think it's you're both doing really incredible work, and I love seeing students moving beyond like that disposal assignment and this more collaborative, collaborative, innovative, public creation of knowledge. But I'm curious if you, and this is kind of my concern as we 
hope to move more in this direction. I'm curious if you have a lot of student pushback about their assignments and their work being available openly and publicly. Um, and I think you mentioned there was an opt-out, so I'm yeah. just I'm curious about your experience with that. Um, or if there has been any negative experience. So for me, I, I'm also very aware of that. So one of the things is that if you feel uncomfortable being online, um, well, first of all, they can always password protect their posts or their websites. It's just gotta be accessible to the class because I want them to share. The other thing is if they're really just uncomfortable being online in some other way, they can come and talk with me. I talk with them multiple times about this. So there's even a session that we did. Um, Tim actually comes in regularly into my classes to talk about this. We did that with the open textbook um, because I was like, okay folks, it's not just gonna be a domain that you can then delete. This is gonna be a living thing that's gonna get a new edition every time I teach this course. Are you guys comfortable? And at one point they even asked me, when, when I kept asking them like, are you not worried? Or you know, are you worried about anything? And they were like, should we be worried about it? <laughs> so like, well, you've, you've had the talk about privacy and online, so I, I understand that you know what the risks are. But I always think about the assignments and what are the skills I'm trying to teach them. Um, and if they really are uncomfortable, they, they can, I mean, and I, I mentioned this to them, if you don't want to do this, we can find an alternative. So far, everyone's done it. There is the odd student who decides to password protect blog posts, but they have that option. So for, for me, the, and Tim might be able to say more about this, the, your, the URLs that the students have are so obscure yes. that, yeah. that we, so when they express fear about it, I say, try searching for your domain, and they can't, they can't find it. So that makes them feel a little bit better when they're just starting out, when they're experimenting. But then ultimately, um, they can buy their own domain name and put that on top, and then it, and then it becomes more searchable, especially. When I link it to, to this, I ask them for their, their permission, because my web pages will put it more out there for them. But they're, they're interested in that. And the other thing is when they ask for letter, uh, letters of recommendation, which they, they ultimately do, yep. um, I say, is it okay if I provide the link to your domain? And they, they go in there and they spruce it up and do a little <laughs> bit, and re, re, it, it reawakens it again yes. you know, a year later, but the, I provide that and I think that that is giving them a certain edge that in, in whether it's for graduate school or fellowship or something like that. There was a question in the back. So I think of the slow fuse, and I think you're two out of however many out of the entire faculty. So, um, which is probably smaller than my university. But I was wondering, do you, how do you do missionary work? Do you have formal opportunities, or I mean, is it just like knocking on doors, or what are strategies that you all use to try to continue the mission? Well, I'm going to invite our colleague Tim to join in here on this response. He'll have he'll have I think other things to add, and he he is like the chief missionary for domains. Um, but and again, you know, so three years ago when we first started, it, it we started with a faculty learning community, a faculty staff learning community. We had like 15 people really dig in with us around what it would look like to start doing this work at New. So those early um, participants, Rich was one of them, um, those early participants helped to lay the groundwork. Informally, every few months, Tim comes to work with about three big boxes of donuts, and we have what he calls donuts and domains. And it's just <laughs> open studio time, come in, get a sugar rush, <laughs> spruce up your site for your whether it's your course, faculty, students, and staff come to that. And, and, and attendance at those kind of wanes, depending on where we are in the semester, but they're really, really popular. And, and Tim, you might see Tim tweeting about domains and donuts. Um, you did the tech thing that. too, right? Where, where? Yeah, we did the tech talk yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, so we also have more formal faculty development tech talks where we present domains. Um, but I, I think this year, um, the community portal that Tim shared in the last session, and if, if you weren't there, please ask us about it. Um, the page you see here, Rich has kind of riffed off of Tim's community portal. The community portal Tim built makes visible just the abundance of work and the diversity of work happening. And that visibility has allowed people 
other faculty, maybe you know, not as all in as Tinica and Rich, to imagine the possibilities of what this might look like in their courses. Tim, would you add anything? The, the only thing I'd add is, um, you know, uh, we've taken a kind of uh, slow fuse approach. We finally felt that we were at a point where we could have an award ceremony, and we um, gave out a lot of awards to faculty, staff, and students. And I think that the, a lot of interest in folks um, who had heard about it or maybe thought about it, I think it's starting to, to also go in that way too. So. And it, it's a fun night, you know. It is fun. And, well, and I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I think that early on, the folks who were showing up at these things were, were primarily drawn by a, a new kind of technological resource, a new, um, a new space to create at Muhlenberg. But I think over these three years, faculty, staff, and students are discovering that it is a pocket of, I'm going to say resistance on campus. It is a, it is a, it is a space of resisting complacency that um, is otherwise kind of gaining momentum across higher education. The, you know, the, all of the ways that our learning institutions are organizing around convenience and customer service but that ultimately don't ignite students' imagination, agency, ownership over their learning. So I think people are starting to catch on to the larger goals of Domain of One's Own, which is to create an intellectual community, a creative community that favors, that actively favors and organizes around agency, voice, and more democratic ways of imagining our work, teaching and learning together. Um, so I think that that's part of what's drawing people to. And the donuts. <laughs> Do not underestimate donuts. Don't underestimate donuts. But, but, but I, you know, the, uh, I often like to play the devil's advocate. Some people say I'm the devil himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I. I'm, somebody may have heard me say this in another topic. Faculty are hard to change. You would think, mm. you know, progressive liberal art scholars would be open, but they're actually pretty closed. And like for me, trying to promote it in my own bio, in the biology department, you know, like some people like think they should be curious about it because they hear about it, but they're really kind of resisting to it. And so I think we just keep doing, you know, and uh, and. Maybe that's the mission. The missionary work is to keep doing it and have students talking about it, and then it catches on. But yeah, I think we do. If that's what makes the fuse slow in some ways is that resistance to any change. And now that I've made this change, I'm kind of addicted to change. So. <laughs> I was just going to add. They basically asked the same question I did. That students can be a really po positive and powerful driver for this, especially mm -hmm. on a small campus where they start talking about it and they also vote with their feet and they know which classes are the good yep. classes to take and they start going to those classes and not the other ones and so or they're talking about the assignments with their their friends and